Remember that a couple of weeks ago, I uh, brought a message. It was, uh, it was titled A Wake Up Call to the Church. Well, the title this morning is Are You Still Awake? <laughs> we made a commitment, didn't we? A corporate commitment that we were, we, were, we were going to embrace an awakening to righteousness. Did we not? If you were here, hallelujah, glory to God. Are you still awake? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You know, who knows that the devil has tried to convince the world that the church is irrelevant in contemporary culture. Have you noticed that? The devil is working very hard to convince the world out there that the church is completely and totally irrelevant in our contemporary culture. But you know what the truth is? This is the absolute truth. The truth is that our message has never been more relevant than it is right now. Our message has never been more relevant than it is right now. The more I've been meditating on this, the more I understand I've been getting of it. And, you know, everything that's happening and everything that's rapidly changing in our world right now, it hasn't taken our God by surprise. <laughs> God's not out there scratching his head going, how did this happen? You know, in Psalm 121 verse 4 it says, Our God never slumbers or sleeps. He's always awake. Amen. Sometimes his church might sleep, but he's always awake. In fact, he gives his beloved sleep. He gives us times of rest. So we, we, we arise refreshed and ready to do everything that he's already equipped us to do. Because he has been equipping us, I believe, to minister in this time. We were born. Say, I was born for such a time as this. Say, I was born for this time right now. I was born again for this time. Right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Who knows, who knows the, the enemy of our souls, he's a counterfeiter. He has no original ideas. He sees what God does and he tries to copy that and counterfeit it and produce a, an inferior copy that he then tries to sell to people as the real deal. I'm going to make a statement this morning. Enlightenment is his counterfeit for revelation. See, we live in an age and a time when people think they're being enlightened. That's why they think the church's message is irrelevant, because they know better now. I've heard people make that statement. I've even heard Christians make that statement. I know what the Word of God says, but we know better now. <laughs> Enlightenment is the enemy's counterfeit for revelation. Enlightenment is always a mind thing. The enemy always tries to roll in something that will take away from what God is doing. Right there in the very beginning in the garden, that's what he did. He, 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 he came in in the form of the serpent and begins to mess with God's best. Begins to work his way into the minds of God's people to try and take them away from God's best for them. And he was successful and he's never stopped. You see, if you find something that works, you're not going to try something else. You're going to keep doing what works. And enlightenment, I believe, is his counterfeit for revelation. Jesus said, the word of God says, he comes as an angel of, of light. Of what? Of false revelation. It's almost, he comes with fake news. He invented fake news. <laughs> but who knows, we have the good news. In fact, we have the really good news. In fact, actually, we have the best news. We have, we, we have the, the truth that sets people Free. Who knows there's all this talk right now about the Great Reset? Well, do you know that God invented the Great Reset? Well, I say the devil is a counterfeiter. And it was, it was our Father in Heaven who invented the Great Reset. And here, here's, let me read you the real Great Reset. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. This is the real, the true reset. Amen. Oh. <coughs> Old things have 
passed away. Behold, all things. No, what? When you hear about that stuff, just say, well, that's the devil. It has to be the devil. All things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reckoning or imputing their trespasses or their sins to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. That's our message to the world. That's the word, that's the message that we carry. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we might be able to stand in God's presence. That we might be able to enter and to stand in his presence without a sense of fear or guilt or shame or condemnation or anything that was attached to our past. The past that is already gone. You know, after, the, the, after I brought that message a couple weeks ago, I can just continue to meditate on what I've been talking about and, and what I've been studying previous to that. And, and I mean, do you remember singing that song? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I started to think, because that, that's what it was at. And remember Sunday school days and when you're a child and everything was so carefree and, and you just believed that Jesus loved you. So when, you, when there was time to sing, Jesus loves me, you just, Jesus loves me, come on. Yes, Jesus loves me. I mean, you didn't have any doubt. You didn't have a wee doubt in the back of your mind where I wonder if he really does. You just sang it because, you were, because the Bible said so. And you just believed it. I began to think, when did we move from Jesus loves me to God hates me? How did that happen? How did we move from Jesus loves the little children to God hates the grown-ups? I came up with this term um, about a year ago, I think it was, maybe Katrina might remember better than me, but uh, the, I call it the Great Awakening. Because that's the devil's counterfeit. Because what's the church believing for? A Great Awakening. So the devil rolls in the Great Awakening. Because at different times in history there have been these what they call Great Awakenings that really did change the culture of the world. But the devil comes up with this great awakening, this whole woke thing. <laughs> but I mean, as I was meditating on this recently, I thought all of the issues that are promoted in the current great awakening, every one of them is rooted in identity. Racial identity, sexual identity, gender identity, and on and on it goes. It's all about identity. And all about people wanting to I don't change their identity. You know what they're really looking for? God's great reset. The real change of identity. But the devil's brought in all this other stuff. All of this other junk. All of this other counterfeit rubbish. You see, all of these issues that people struggle with, and I'm not denying that people are struggling with these things, and they're, they're certainly get, getting fed a, a false message, a counterfeit message. And no, no wonder more and more people are beginning to struggle with these things. But all of these issues are dealt with and resolved in the great awakening to righteousness. Because we receive a brand new identity in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. A brand new identity in Christ that is the foundation of a brand new life. A supernatural life. I heard, I some, somebody asked him, I think it was George Whitfield one time, why? Because I think he preached on uh, John 3.16 about 500 times or something. And somebody said, why do you keep preaching in John 3.16? Uh, not on John 3.16, but you must be born again. He said, because you must be born again. <laughs> Amen. We, we, you don't understand it until you're born again. Something happens when you're born again. Everything changes. Amen. 
Your attitudes change, your appetites change, everything you're pursuing changes direction. You're no longer going after the same things anymore. You've got a brand new life, a supernatural life. And it's an exciting life. It's a fulfilled life. It's an overcoming life. It's a victorious life. In fact, it's an exceeding, abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine life. And it becomes more unbelievably, fantastically good the more revelation we get of how much Jesus loves me. This side. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 3. As we get more revelation of the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of his love, we begin to move into the exceedingly, abundantly more that we can even ask, think, or imagine life. It's all based on that. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 10 verse 11 to 13 says, For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him, here's that whoever again, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek or Jew and Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Racial identity doesn't matter anymore. You've got a new identity in Christ. It's called in Christ. In Christ. That's your new identity. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of the Most High. You're a child of God. In Christ. New identity. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Black, white, red. I, I, remember, I, I love what Jesse DeFanta said one time. He said, he said there is no, absolutely no room whatsoever for racism in this world and, and certainly not in the church. He said, God made Adam from the dust. He says, from the dirt, he said. He said, you get black dirt, brown dirt, red dirt, yellow dirt, and white dirt. It's all dirt. <laughs> it's all dust. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction. There's no distinction between Presbyterian and Pentecostal. There's no distinction. In Christ, there is no distinction. Everything that God made available to one Lord, he made available to them all. He's rich to all. He's rich to all. Any Presbyterian that wants it can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, can speak in tongues. Glory to God. Amen. Can lay hands on the sick. Can do all the things that they've labeled Pentecostal. Amen. Hallelujah. And any Pentecostal church that wants can have elders and deacons and <laughs> all that stuff. Or that can, have, can choose that form of church government if they want. Amen. There is no distinction. In Christ, there is no distinction between the Baptists and the Methodists. <laughs> For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So you even, you just, you're, you're, you're content with who you are. You don't need to change your, your, your sexual identity, your gender identity. You don't need to change that anymore. Because you're in Christ now. And you're a male in Christ or you're a female in Christ. But it doesn't make, there's no distinction between the two. Amen. There's no need for you to think you need to be the other. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not trying to mock anybody or anything. I'm just saying this is the answer. This is what people are looking for. This is what their, their hearts are truly pursuing and seeking after. And the enemy has rolled in. The enemy of people so that the enemy who hates people with a passion has rolled in all of this stuff to try and sucker people and, and get them to mutilate their own bodies and everything. Just to try and, and, and fulfill something that can be fulfilled in, in, in a moment of time when they're born again and receive a new identity. In Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a brand new order of creation. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, this, this is to us, to the church. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Do not fall short of God's glory. You need to get a hold of who you are. You're a new creation in Christ. <laughs> You're like Jesus. You know that you can, I could add to that, that definition of righteousness of being able to stand in his presence and I could even say without a sense of inferiority. 
you might, you might fall over at that one. <laughs> you have as much right to come into God's presence now as Jesus does. In fact, he took you and he sat you down with him right there at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. That's where we live. That's our new address. People ask you, where do you live? At the right hand of the Father. <laughs> do you know where the Father lives? Well, I'm just on the right of that. Oh, is it? <laughs> when you get to heaven, I'll be at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. Awake to righteousness. Do not fall short of God's glory. Don't talk like you're something less than you are. You need to know who you are. People say, who do you think you are? I don't think who I am. I know who I am. It gives you a confidence. And I'm not talking about some kind of holier than thou sort of stuff. That's religion for that mess up. I'm talking about knowing who you are. Speaking out of who you are. If you know you're a child of God, that changes everything. If God's your father, that's got to change everything about everything. That's got to remove all doubt, all fear. <laughs> Come on, it's gone. Unbelief doesn't have a place anymore. That's why Jesus scratched his head. What's wrong with you guys? Where's your faith? <laughs> he said, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Everywhere we go, every, every person that, we ever, that we've met with in the last weeks or years or months, the people that we meet with every day should know that there's something different about us. That we are carrying something, that we have something that they can have. That we are telling them, you can have this, there's something you can have. A new life in Christ and it changes everything. It's not just a ticket in your back pocket stamped heaven when you die. It's a whole life, a brand new, exciting, supernatural, overcoming, victorious life to be enjoyed every moment of every single day. If somebody's happy, smile or something. Come on, hallelujah. See, our, our message, our testimony is that God loves people. How do you know he loves people? Because he loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Why do you know that? Because the Bible tells me so. Hallelujah. Amen. On every page, on every page, the Bible shouts out at me, God loves you. God loves you. Our message, our testimony is that God loves people so much that he actually has a brand new life for every person. A brand new life for every issue related to the old life is completely resolved. And a whole new level of experience is opened up before us. Hallelujah. An unimaginable life. I could give you testimony after testimony of things that, 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 that God has opened up for me in this new life that were shut to me in the old life. Closed. I've been to places that I would never have been. I remember when I was drinking out other stuff, the old wine, I, was, I, mean, I, mean, I, was, I had this dream of one day I'll go to Greece and pick grapes or something, you know. Never ever made it. One day I'll go on a, on a canal boat down the Norfolk Broads. Never made it. You know why? Because everything, everything that, that I needed to get there was getting, well, was I getting too graphic? <laughs> well, it was going down a plug hole. <laughs> but then all of a sudden you've got a brand new life. And God opens the world up to you. I've been to places I'd never have been. That's a reality. I've met people I'd never have met. I've, I've, I've got a wonderful wife, hallelujah. Four wonderful children, seven incredible grandchildren, hallelujah. I couldn't have been married in my old life. It wasn't going to work, it just would not have worked. It couldn't have worked, more than a fortnight. I was too selfish. That's just the, that's the bottom line. <laughs> I mean, that's just, you could go on and on and on, think about these things. That's, that's what the old hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. And they might come round and slap you in the back of the head and surprise you what God has done. <laughs> come on, there's more. He says there's always more. There's exceeding abundantly above all. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. 
See, that was Jesus' message. And that's our message. You know, the only people who will reject our message and our testimony are those, and I see it happen very often, but the only people who will reject our message and our testimony are those who have been deceived into believing that their old lives and their ways of dealing with the issues of their old lives are better. Jesus said that. He said some people are going to say that the old wine is better. (laughs) For now. Amen. Just because someone rejects what you're saying for now, you don't stop. You don't quit. You don't walk away. You just keep bringing the same message. Hallelujah. I mean, do you know that Jesus was crucified for his message? And that Stephen was stoned? Stephen, the first martyr of the, of, the, of, the, of the brand new church, was stoned for his message? But you know what else? Their response to their persecutors was exactly the same. They didn't change, they didn't alter their message or their testimony in any way in the face of those who were responsible for their persecution. In fact, Jesus said, Luke chapter 23, verse 34, from the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And Stephen said, Acts chapter 7, verses 59 to 60, It says, as they stoned Stephen, he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So the the response in the face of their persecutors was exactly the same. Hallelujah. You see, that's how unconditional love, that's how the supernatural love of God works. Because it is unconquerable benevolence and undefeatable goodwill. You cannot conquer love. Love never fails. That's why I've said this for years. The Lord gave me this statement years ago, and and some of you know it off by heart. If you can't reach people with love, then they, Joe, they can't be reached. If you can't reach them with love, you don't try anything else. We did that, we tried that before, you know, you try you bring a bit of law, you bring a bit of this, you bring a bit of coercion, a wee bit of threatening, a wee bit of, you know, come on. <laughs> no, no, if you can't reach them with love, they can't be reached. Yet, at least. You don't try anything else, you don't change your tactics, you just tactics or strategy, you just keep loving them. I mean, Jesus is on the cross and he's saying, Father, forgive them. Stephen has been stoned, he says, Do not lay this to their charge. And it got the attention of a young man that day. I mean, Jesus' statement is still working. (laughs) Come on. His statement from the cross is still working every single day in every part of the world. People are being born again because he said, forgive them. Forgive them. What happened was Stephen got the attention of a young man who'd been left holding the coats of those who were stoning him. And the church would be a much poorer place if he hadn't responded to that. Come on. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He gave me the Apostle Paul. Or Paul an Apostle, I prefer to call him. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you can't reach people with love, they can't be reached. Love, there's a power attached to love that is just <laughs> beyond anything else. Because God has love. The reality is, folks, that the message has never changed from Jesus loves you to God hates you. Can you remember a time in your life when maybe the, 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 that message began to change for you? Well, the reality was the message was never meant to change. That's why there's even a lot of people, even a lot of God's people, even a lot of God's children who still live in fear. The wrong ki- I'm not talking about reverence. I'm not talking about that, 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 that place of, of all oh, that place of, wow, never lose that, never lose the wonder. I mean, the fact that you can stand in this presence with this, I mean, most people fall down there anyway, but, but you are allowed to stand there. 
I mean, usually your first response when the presence of God manifests in real power is like, you're boom, you know. But all through the word of God, God says, get up. <laughs> Stand up. It's hard to be talking to me when you're lying down there. Come on, get up. <laughs> Stand up. What are you falling down for? Get up. <laughs> See, at the cross, heaven's one and only solution to all of the ills of the world was being demonstrated in all of its glory. Where? At the cross. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love. That's, that's, I love the way it says that. He demonstrates his own love. This is a love that's unique to God. But it's also a love that Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, he pours out into our hearts. By the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That's why he's given us the Holy Spirit. So we can love the way God loves. We can love with the love of God. We can have that unconquerable benevolence. That undefeatable goodwill. That, that love that never quits. That never fails. That just keeps on loving. Even in the face of persecution. And, and mockery. And everything else that comes your way. God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still Sinners, you see, we're, we're, we don't wait until people start to show a wee bit, of, a wee bit of signs that they might be changing. No, we love them. And I've, and I've used this illustration many, many times, as some of you know. But, but when we were doing the very worst thing we've ever done, the thing we are most ashamed of in our lives, the thing that I hope you don't you to remember it anymore because it's in the past now. But the, the thing that you, you, you've probably least like everybody else in this room to know about at that very point. God demonstrated his love towards us when Christ died for us. At that, point, at that moment, the thing we're most ashamed of, he died for us right there. Hallelujah. That's why we can know the past is gone, it's dealt with. There's a whole new life opened up before us. Does the world not need to hear that? There's people out there carrying shame that think, that, well, and the, and the church is condemning them for it sometimes. Well, that's the message they get. That's why it's time for us to turn up the volume on our message and our testimony. Tell people what God's done for you. Every opportunity, tell them, bring it in, slip it in there. I tell you, in almost every statement that somebody makes, you can bring a testimony on the back of it. Sometimes people find that irritating, but just keep doing it anyway. <laughs> Irritate them into the kingdom. Hallelujah. I remember when I was doing milk round ministries, Right around this area, from Barbas to back to Dalbeg, hallelujah. You know, you turn every statement that someone makes into a, into a, into a testimony. Hallelujah. <laughs> wow, it's, it's very cloudy today. I but the sun's still shining up there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Where that God? Anything new today? Always something new every day. Always got good news. Oh, well. <laughs> Anything fresh? Yeah, there's fresh manna from heaven. Hallelujah. Do you want some? <laughs> Every single day, hallelujah. One woman said to me, one day, up in one part of the area, what was she said? She said, you know, in this street they call you Donny Delight. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite, uh, quite shocking. It's Donny Delight. I quite like that because it means you're Donny the Light, you know. <laughs> hallelujah. She said, because you always bring something positive. You always have something positive. You see, at the cross, Jesus turned every negative into a positive. Amen? Hallelujah. It's time to turn up the volume on our message and our testimony. That's what we're here to do. And I'm going to tell you, when you, if you begin to do that, get ready for the... Because I believe we're, we're in a season right now where the Holy Spirit is, is right there to confirm His Word. With salvations, with healings, with deliverances, with demonstrations of supernatural power, with manifestations of glory like we've never seen before. So I, 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 that's why I say everywhere I go, the glory's here. I'm, I, I don't always recognize that the glory is manifesting, but the glory is here and it's ready to manifest. His glory fills this place and he wants to manifest his glory in here this morning. If you've come here with a need that, 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 that needs a supernatural solution, then you need to understand God's glory is right there, hovering over you right now, ready to manifest. Hallelujah.
And I believe we're coming to that place where the knowledge of the glory of the Lord and his goodness will cover the earth, even as the waters cover the sea. When we were in Edinburgh last week and we took a wee trip on the bus with the, with the grandkids and, and, and two of our daughters into the, into the city. And of course the festival's on there and the place is just jam-packed the streets so you can hardly walk in the streets and people from every tribe and every nation are there and, and I, as I was walking through I was thinking wow how many of these people are lost how many of these people are still lost and, and, and it just gives you this microcosm of what the world is just full of lost people you know some of them are old old people with sticks you know and, and, and I'm thinking how many of them actually know Jesus And that's the reality, but it's time for the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And because I was thinking, we're walking down here, they're all looking at all these people performing and everything, or they're looking at the ground and looking for a penny or something, I don't know. And, and, and the glory's there. We even walked into St. Giles Cathedral and all these tourists are walking around poking things and looking, reading plaques and stuff. And I think, the glory, this place is full of the glory of God. He even represents, it's a, it's a, it's a cathedral that's supposed to represent a place, a house of God. And how many people are actually in here seeking God? They're reading the history and they're, they're fascinated by the architecture, but how many of them are actually in there seeking the Lord? See, there's one way that God ordained for people to get born again. One way. Preaching. Proclaiming. Testifying. <coughs> Amen. That's our job. That's our remit. Tell people. Tell them it. There's good news you have for them. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For to this end we both labour and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God. I want you to hear this. Who is the saviour of all men. <clears throat> Especially of those who believe. So Jesus died for all men. Now, some people would stop there, uh, 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 the saviour of all men, and, then, and, and, and they have a universalist gospel, uh, message that says, well, because Jesus died for everybody, then everybody's going to be saved in the end. Well, we know that's not true. Because it goes on and it says, especially of those who believe. But how shall they say, in Romans chapter 3, it says, how shall they hear? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without preacher so it's our responsibility to ensure that they hear that they hear what the good news not just the good news but the best news that we awaken them to what to righteousness awaken them to some religious conversion that causes them to go into church and feel condemned every time they show up there like Alec prayed this morning you don't you don't tell people they're sinners and then when they come back next week after they get born again tell them they're still sinners you've got to tell them there's something different now as I said the last time, the church has had revival after revival after revival. But their revivals are old covenant, they're old testament. They're the end result of people trying to, thinking they've got themselves into some place or position where God's now pleased with them. He's pleased with you. That's your awakening to righteousness. Your awakening to righteousness is that he's already pleased with you. So revival's the end result, but awake, new covenant awakening is the beginning. Of a whole new life, a whole new experience. The, the whole of heaven and the whole of glory opens up before you. Like, whoa, come on, let's get a hold of some of this. Let's spread it around, let's share it out. Hallelujah. I've just been reading through a, a book of, of history, the history of, of, of seven or eight or ten different revivals on this island. I was, I was reading it again in the field last night. I'll tell, I tell you how it came about it because. Uh, I, was, I was out delivering tweeds one day and this, this weaver said to me, so I'm just reading a book right now. He says, I think your house is on the cover. I says, what? He says, ah, your house is on the cover. I says, really? He says, yeah, it's a book about revival. I says, eh? I says, what's it called? <laughs> so he gave me the title and, 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 and I went on to Amazon and sure enough, boom, boom, boom. And there, I was, I've got the book. I said, could I, I could have brought it with me. And there's, there's, there's a pic, Katrina's mother's house, our house, Katrina's grandparents' house. There's the lion's head, there's the shape of the, the, of, of the, of the island of Lewis and Harris, the glory. On the, come on, have a shakaba. The book's called The People God Chose to Love. It's just a history, and I thought, well, and it's, it's interesting, green through, but I think, but 
Every single one. You just see God awakening the church to righteousness and then it getting downgraded to a revival. Remember? God doesn't do downgrades. He does upgrades. He only ever does upgrades. He gives you new for old. <laughs> Every time. Hallelujah. To this end we both labour and suffer reproach. I, 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 I don't know about you, but I've been out there labouring and a lot of times suffering reproach. But we don't give up because we trust in the living God. The God who says, if you sow, you will reap. If you keep sowing and not give up and not quit, then you will have a harvest. <laughs> Love never fails. He was the saviour of all men, especially of those who believe. But how shall they hear without a preacher? How, how, and and how, how shall they go unless they're sent? How shall they preach unless they're sent? Do you know that we've been sent? Jesus sent us, hallelujah, into all the world. To do what? To do one thing, to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. To preach the good news, the best news. Anybody still awake this morning? <laughs> and that, that's, that's why we need to stay awake to righteousness. The enemy is continually trying to steal your revelation of righteousness. Do you know that? He's trying to bring you back under condemnation. That's why it says there in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. To, to who? To those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Stay in the spirit with us, glory to God. The only reason that, that, you, that, you can, that you can call yourself righteous is because you've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when is that ever going to run out? When's that going to wear out? When's that going to get past its sale by date? Not ever, 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 ever. Do you know that the more you think of yourself as a sinner, the more you'll be inclined to sin? Yeah. Do you know that the more that you think of yourself as, as being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, the more inclined you will be to live a righteous life and to avoid sin and to resist sin and to say, no, I don't do that anymore. That's part of the old life. That's what we're talking about. That's, we're not, there's no such thing as existing with two different... We don't have two natures. We have a new nature. The old sinner nature is gone. You don't have two natures. You only have one nature. It's a new righteousness nature. Hallelujah. You're not in some civil war in your own life. You've got an enemy that's trying to suck you here, there, and everywhere. You've got old inclinations in your soul, but that's why you need to live out of your spirit and let your, let your mind be renewed. Hallelujah. Let's stay awake to righteousness. Let's introduce people to the reality of the living and loving God. We trust in the living God. We trust in the loving God, the God who is love. The God who's already reconciled people to himself. He's done the work that he needed to do. And I'll tell you, if they receive the revelation of his love, they will believe. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. No, no, no matter what kind of religious setup you can conceive, it means nothing anymore. Remember what Paul said? He said uh, he, he, he listed a, a, a whole list of, of everything that was to his advantage in the natural and in the religious. But he said, well, I don't count it as anything anymore. I count it as so much dung. So much rubbish. Why? Because I, that I might gain Christ. Hallelujah. Because in Christ, everything changes. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, faith, uh, circ neither circumcision in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through Love. In the Amplified Bible it says, For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith that is activated. Now, that's what I want to emphasize this morning. Faith is activated. People will believe. Faith is energized. Faith is expressed and works and put to work through love. When people get the revelation of God's love for them, it, it activates their faith. Amen. We aren't here to promote a religion, folks. We are here to invite people into a relationship. A relationship with God that's already been made possible because of what Jesus accomplished on their behalf at the cross. Do you know that the greatest need in every life can only be met by the revelation and the acceptance of the Father's unconditional love? 
And it's at that point that true identity is restored to people. Their true identity. Hallelujah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just, to, to close this morning, I'm going to read the Father's love letter. I was on the ferry this, last night and I just failed to do this this morning. And um, but I'm not just going to read you words. You see, in the words of this, of this love letter from the Father, they're, they're all from the Scripture, obviously. They're all based on Scripture. And as, and as I'm reading this, I, want, I, want to, I believe the glory is here this morning. I want to encourage you, let the Holy Spirit minister, because he's the only one who can minister to you the truth of God's word and make it real for you. And I believe that as I read this, there's maybe some things that, 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 that the Holy Spirit is going to come on the back of and confirm in your life as you, as you just open up your heart to him. This is the Father's lovely heart. This is, the, this is the words of your Father in heaven to you. The words of his love to you. The, wor- the words that you're about to experience, they're true. You're not just going to hear them, you're going to experience them if you allow the Holy Spirit to do what he can, only he can do. These words come from the very heart of God. Why? Because he loves you. Say, he loves me. Say, my father loves me. You just tell yourself that often. My, you need to remind yourself. My father, if you don't remind yourself, you'll forget. My father loves me. Well, that's, when, I, when I feel pain or something in my body, I say, well, well, I've got nowhere else to go but to you. You're my healer. You're my daddy. You're my father. You, you said you'd heal me. You can do it. I've got nowhere else to go with this but to you. I, I, I can't think of I've got no other recourse. See, my father loves me. You know, he, he's, he, he's the father that's been looking out for us all of our lives. And this is his love letter to you. Please listen. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you as I read this. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Let me just remind you, that means whatever he's doing or whatever you've been up to, he's familiar with all of your ways, but he's still saying, I love you. And I want you back in my plan for your life. He said, even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you are made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You are not a mistake because all of your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but I'm the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish, get the language, to lavish my love on you. Simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, because I am provider, your provider, and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts towards you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good 
to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and with all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvellous things. Please, please allow these words to go deep in you this morning. I want to show you great and I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul and I want to show you great and marvellous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And I'll take away all the pain that you have suffered on this earth. What a promise. I am your Father. And I love you, even as I love my son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. Yes, Jesus loves me. And no, God does not hate me. (laughs) He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you. And to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home, and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been your father, and I will always be your father. My question is, will you be my child? Let me just add this. Will you awake to righteousness? Will you allow yourself to be the child that he has always wanted you to be a child who simply trusts him, who believes him. He says, I am waiting for you. Love your dad, almighty God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love letter to us. Thank you for your words of love. Lord, that, 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 that just you deposit deep down on the inside of us, Father. Lord, we recognize that there's a world out there right now waiting to meet with you. They're looking in all the wrong places. And they're pursuing you in all the wrong ways. But we know and we believe that meeting with you is the answer to all of their questions. It's the solution to all of their problems. It's the way of resolving all of their issues. Thank you that love is always the answer. Love is always the key. That love never fails. Thank you, Lord, that you are the author of the great reset. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. I just pray, Father God, even as these words have been spoken out in here this morning, I pray, Father God, that each heart, Lord, would absorb the reality and the truth of these words, Lord God, that they would become strength to us, Lord. They become confidence to us, become encouragement to us, Lord. Fill us with boldness and encouragement, Lord God, to know who we are in Christ. That even as you sent Jesus, you are now sending us into this world, carrying this message, Lord, that never fails, this message of your love, demonstrating your love, Lord reaching out to people with needs and praying for them, Lord, and and believing that your kingdom will come on earth, even as it is in heaven. That that which you've already provided for in earth and in heaven will will manifest in the earth. People's lives will be changed, Father. 
Let your glory, let your glory, Lord, let your glory manifest, Lord, I pray, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glorify your name, Lord. That's what we want, Lord. We want to see your name glorified. We want to see your name lifted up. We want people acknowledging, Lord, that you are the Father that they've been looking for all of their lives, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God's word is a... says in Jeremiah, that God's word is like a hammer. There's a lot of hardness in there. I know because I'm out every day and amongst people in, in the different communities on this island. And there's a lot of hardness out there in, respond, in, in regards to responding towards God's love. But God's word is a hammer. It doesn't matter how hard that heart is, you just keep chipping away. And I discovered this on a chain gang over in Maryland. <laughs> it's called the Zone Creation. We were building a, a big pier and there was these big rocks and they would give you a hammer, that's what they gave you, a big sledgehammer. You had to break the rocks up so you could make them smaller so they would fit together and you could make this new causeway thing. So, you know. <laughs>